Good morning. Happy hump day. Hump, hump day. Yes, ma'am. I hope you had a wonderful Valentine's Day. I sure did. Hi, Adam Nevy, if you're tuning in. Thank you for the Valentine. You're very sweet. Let's, we're going to read more, a little bit more of The Valley of the Dolls by Jacqueline Suzanne. And here is my shout out, is my fan. I had another fan exactly like this one, but he passed away. The, the motor burns out on it eventually. I'm so heartbroken because this time of year, it's impossible to find a fan. It's winter. The stores don't carry them, and I don't want to buy anything online if I don't have to. So I have to wait. Maybe in another maybe six weeks, fans will start showing back up in the stores. And I might buy two, even though I don't need to. But... You know how things are getting kind of weird and expensive, so I, I want to stock up on this. This is great. I like to have one in the bedroom. It makes just the right amount of white noise and enough air, not too much. I don't want it too warm or cold in the bedroom. I turn the heat off sometimes because of the noise from the heat. And this is my product placement is my barrettes. These are very clever design. See, you just snap it and then you can put it in your hair like that. See? And then it unsnaps it like that. So it's very clever. It's very low tech, but very highly useful. And then I just put it back in the little thing, the little cardboard. That's it. So let's just dig right in. It's morning and I've got things to do. I've got a busy day ahead but I wanted to read some before I left for the day. And we are already up to 100, a page 157. Okay. She woke up in his arms the following day. She lay there not moving, looking at his strong profile. He was beautiful in sleep. Sex had been painful again, but she had re reveled in the satisfaction she had given him. And for the first time, she felt she belonged to someone all the things she never even discussed with girls, things that seemed too personal to talk about even with Neely. She had talked about openly and freely with Leon. The rhythm system, all the precautions. She eased herself out of his arms and went into the kitchen. She had coffee going and eggs in a pan before she looked at the clock. It was afternoon. He was awake when she placed the eggs on the table. He praised her cooking. The eggs were perfect. The coffee, a work of art. After breakfast, he settled down with the times while she showered. He looked up in surprise when she appeared fully dressed, her coat on her arm. Walking out on me, he pulled her down on the couch. You are the most fleeting romance I've ever had. He kissed her neck and she felt herself go limp. She forced herself to pull away. Lynn, I can't go to the office tomorrow in the same clothes. I need a change of stockings, underwear. I've got to get home. He looked at his watch. Fair enough. I'll pick you up at seven. We'll have dinner and be prepared to go off to go to the office from here. She kissed him gratefully. She had been momentarily frightened that he would ask her to return. She took the luxury of grabbing a cab. It was already three o'clock and she had so much to do before seven. The moment she walked into her room, the world closed in on her. There was a large vase of flowers on the bureau. The card was from Alan. Hope you miss me like I missed you. Call me the second you get in. I love you, Alan. Until Friday, this room had known another life. Now she felt like a stranger. She had shed the room like she had shed Lawrenceville. She looked at the roses. It couldn't be put off. Couldn't be put off. She was going to Philadelphia tomorrow with Leon and Alan expected to go, and Gino. She dialed Alan, but stopped halfway and hung up. Maybe she could send a wire, but she had to return the ring. It hung lifelessly and heavily on the side of her finger. She dialed again. He answered on the second ring. Well, how was New Haven and your girlfriend, old Ironsides? The show is a hit. I know Gino ran into some some people at Morocco last night who had been to New Haven. How was Morocco? I wasn't there. Remember me, I'm an engaged man. I sat home with both nights with a good book waiting for my girl to get back. Alan, Alan, I've got something to tell you. She rushed on knowing it had 
to come in a burst or she'd lose her nerve. Alan, I'm not your girl and I'm not engaged to you and I want to give back the ring. There was a long silence and he said, Anne, I'll be right over. Now, Alan, I'll meet you somewhere. I'll give you back the ring. I don't want the ring. I want to talk to you. But there's nothing to talk about. There isn't? Good God, Anne. For three months I've been in love with you. Now you want to wash the whole thing up with a phone call? What happened? Did someone talk against me in New Haven? Look, I've done a lot of crazy things in the past. Sometimes I wasn't a very nice guy, but that was before I met you. You can't hold anything I did then against me now. Nothing meant anything until you came along. Someone scared you off me, and I'm going to see you and find out. I won't give up just like this. I have a right to present my side, Alan. No one spoke against you in New Haven. And talking to me won't change things. I'll be right over. Alan, don't come, she shrieked. I'm in love. This time the silence was even longer. Finally, she said hesitantly, Alan, do you understand? Who is he? Leon Burke. His laugh was unpleasant. You mean the homeless cockney who's in my old apartment? Well, glad to have provided you with a decent honeymoon cottage, Alan. It just happened. Sure, just like that. And it just happened you fell out of love with me. I never told you I loved you. Remember that. You were the one who insisted on being engaged. Okay, Anne, good luck. How do I get the ring back to you? I'm not worried about it. Why are you? But I want you to have it back. You mean Leon Burke gets offended seeing it on your finger? Or has he already replaced it? From what I've heard about him, the only thing you'll get is one through, the, through your nose. Alan, let's not part this way. What do you mean? Shall I send you a singing telegram? Boy, this is really the prize. The first time in my life I treat a girl on the level and I get it in the end. But I'll see you around. With Leon Burke, it will be a long, long walk to the altar. Please, Alan, may I see you at lunch tomorrow and return the ring? Not, no, my little iceberg, keep it. Keep it, you bitch, I don't need the ring. I can buy a lot of them. Uh... Uh, but you're going to need it. It's very hockable. Or better yet, wear it. Let it cut into your finger every time some guy screws you like you've screwed me. I have a hunch Leon Burke will be the first. The receiver slammed in her ear. She dialed him back immediately. Alan, I know you're furious at me and the things you've said. You've said in anger, I want us to remain friends. I like my men for friends, he said coldly. All right, but I can't keep the ring. If that's what you called about it, forget it. Alan wait. She knew he was going to hang up. I want to remind you about Gino. He promised to go to Philadelphia tomorrow. You mean that's still on with us? There was a sudden tinge of hope in his voice. Well, not with us. I can't go with you now. But there's no reason for Gino not to go. Helen is expecting him. Oh, no, you must be kidding. Hi, how are you? Good to see you. Oh, no, you must be kidding. His laugh was almost a groan. Why, Helen reserved a room for him. He operates independently of you. I see no reason for Helen to be disappointed because of us. Hi. You don't. Well, now I've heard everything. Do you think Gino wanted to go? Do you think it's a thrill for him to wrestle with old Ironsides? Stop calling Helen that. She's darned attractive, and your father should be thrilled that she wants to be with him. She's a big star, and... Uh, and a brassy boar. My father can have any girl in town. This is a man's world. Women only own it when they're very young. You'll find that out some fine day. And your Helen Lawson may be the biggest star on Broadway, but she's still a bloated, loudmouth broad the moment she steps off stage. Sure, he was coming tomorrow, and don't think he didn't try to get out of it, but I forced him. Isn't that a laugh? I made him do it for you and I spent all weekend trying to figure out how to keep him there overnight. He agreed to come, but swore he was driving back right after the show. I finally said it would be like a wedding present to me, and he'd give in to Helen just for the night. Can you imagine that? A guy compromising his own father just to please his girl? All weekend I've been working on Gino, and all weekend you've been... He stopped. His voice had almost broken. Well, at least one good thing has come out of it. Gino is spared. And now I'm tossing the ball to you and to Liam Burke. Let his father hump your girlfriend, the receiver clip.
The Philadelphia opening of Hit the Sky was a much smoother and glossier version of the New Haven premiere. Anne was amazed at the changes that had been accomplished in such a short time. She sat beside Leon, identifying with the cast rather than the audience. He held her hand and she wondered if he had noticed the absence of a large diamond. It was resting in a plain manila envelope in her new safe deposit box. It had seemed cruel leaving the large solitaire all alone. In that cold tin box, it had seemed to glitter in outrage, anger, as if it were protesting its uncalled-for rejection. Leon's whispered snapped, her thoughts back to the stage. It was Neely's big moment. The ballad had been reinstated. Anne sat on the edge of her seat when Neely began to sing. It was a completely different interpretation. Terry King in her slinky red satin dress had seemed disenchanted and sultry. Neely in a blue dress with a Peter Pan collar was haunting, forlorn, and alone. There was a vibrant wail to her voice. Now it was a torch song, very different and more plaintive. She received a tremendous ovation. Several times during the show, Anne glanced nervously at the three empty seats in the fourth row. Helen had reserved those seats, and she was supposed to be sitting there between Alan and Gino. She hadn't broken the news to Helen. She felt it might hurt her performance. The curtain came down at 11.15. There was no doubt of the show's success. Even Henry Bellamy's usual look of harassment had evaporated. He passed Leanne and Anne as they came backstage. The party will be at the Warwick. Leanne looked at his watch. You don't really care about going, do you? She hadn't thought about it. She had assumed Henry had reserved rooms for them at the hotel. They had come to the theater directly from the train. She had an oversized handbag in which she had crammed a nightgown and a toothbrush. She suddenly realized Leon was without his usual attache case. If we make a fast dash backstage and congratulate Helen and Neely, we can catch the 1225 back to New York. Whatever you say, Leon. I think I'd rather have my drink in the club car with you. We both need one good night's sleep, and this party is bound to last way into the morning. They elbowed their way through the crowd, cluttering the hallways of the dressing rooms. Anne went directly to Neely's room. She was standing outside the door, surrounded by a few newspaper men. Members of the cast stopped by offering congratulations. Mel stood at her side, silent and beaming with pride. Anne embraced her. Neely, you're, you were wonderful. Was I really honest? I'll be better after I get used to it. And these were makeshift costumes. I'm getting new set for New York. Leon offered his congratulations. Ne uh, Neely looked startled. Where's Alan? I'll tell you some other time, Anne said quietly. Nothing wrong, is it? Neely insisted. Gosh, Helen was like a schoolgirl because Gina was out front tonight. And you're supposed to be with Alan. Anne felt herself coloring. Neely's clear voice carried halfway down the hall. Alan isn't here, Anne, through. Anne said through her teeth. That's obvious, Neely said. Hey, the ring. She grabbed Anne's hand. Where's the ring? Neely, we'll talk about it in another time. I've got to go down and congratulate Helen. If Gino isn't here, you better get out of town fast. They pushed their way through the crowd into Helen's dressing room. Helen broke away from several people and came toward Anne's with her arms outstretched. Hi, she said merrily. Then her eyes went past Anne expectantly. When she saw Leon, she, sh she looked at Anne questioningly. Where's everybody? They didn't come. What? It's a long story, Helen. That son of a bitch, what happened? I'll, I'll tell you later. It had better be good. Come on inside while I change and tell me. Helen, we're, Leon and I were, were taking the 1225 back to New York. You're kidding. Anne shook her, head mute, shook her head mutely. You mean you're not coming to the party? I have to be in the office tomorrow, Helen. Balls. If I say I want you here, then that's it. It's the least Henry can do for me. He went back tonight, so you stay. Then turning to everyone in the room, she shouted, Hey, the party's at the Warwick. You'll have to scram now so I can change. There was the usual hum of goodbyes mingled with more congratulations. When they were alone, Helen turned to Anne and Leon. Leon, you wait in the hall. Anne can sit here while I change. He looked at his watch. We'd best be leaving, Anne, if you want to catch the last decent train. Oh, swell, Henry doesn't even leave you as a replacement. Next thing I know, we'll be sending me that owl-faced George Bellows. He's going to hear from me. 
Who in hell is going to escort me to the party? Why didn't Henry stay? Anne asked. Because I told him Gina would be here, Helen snarled. I want to hear about that. What in hell happened? Leon glanced at his watch again. I'll hail us a cab, Anne. He smiled briefly at Helen and left the room. Boy, am I getting stood up all around tonight, Helen said. She sat at the dressing table and began powdering down her makeup. Helen, the show was just great tonight, Anne said. I'm sorry I have to leave now, but Leon wants to make the train. Then let him, for Christ's sake. What's that got to do with you? Anne searched for an excuse. I have no hotel reservation. So what? I have a suite with two beds. You can stay with me. But I came with Leon. She looked longingly toward the door. Helen's eyes widened. Oh, I get it. Still playing footies with Leon? Jesus, you're like the rest. You're you, the one girl who had class, who I cared about. My buddy, buddy, running out on me. But go on. Hell, that's the story of my life. I give you all my of myself. I always trust people. Tears began to roll down her face. I believed in you, Anne. Hey there, big bulls universe. Good to see you. Uh, I believed in you, Annie, my one friend, but you're like all the others. Kick me in the ass walking out when I need you. Here I am alone on my opening. No guy and my only girlfriend wants to take a powder. Helen, I am your friend. Maybe there's a later train. Let me talk to Leon. Nah, anything after the 1225 is, milk, is the milk train. Helen began to blot her, blot at her running mascara. Go on, I was crazy to expect you to be different. Wait, let me talk to Leon. She dashed out the room. Leon was holding a cab. She rushed to him. Leon, we can't leave her alone. She feels so hurt. He stared at her. Anne, nothing can hurt Helen. You don't understand. She was crying. She feels so alone on her opening night. Helen's tears came easily. And go quickly. Look, Anne. The Helen Lawson of this world would create their own loneliness. But we can't do this to her. We owe Helen nothing other than a business loyalty. Simple things like the crucifixion of Terry King. That she understands and demands. But there is nothing in my contract that states that I must escort her to parties. But Leon, she's my friend. And you choose to remain? I feel we should. He smiled. Okay, goodbye, friend, he said lightly. Then he jumped into the cab. At first she couldn't believe it, but the cab was gone. She didn't know whether to be angry or frightened. Had she let Leon, Leon down, or had he let her down? If she had gone with him, she certainly would have let Helen down. God knows she had let Alan down. She suddenly felt tears coming to her eyes. Everything to, seemed to be crumbling around her. She was hurting everyone, most of all herself. The party at the war rig was a repetition of the party in New Haven, except for Neely's appearance as a full-fledged principal. There were more people from New York, different newspaper men, and Helen drinking heavily was still every inch the hearty, good-natured star. There had been people in the dressing room when Anne had returned, and she had not been able to explain about Gina. She sat through the festivities, watching, feeling outside of everything, worrying about Leon and feeling numb. At two in the morning, when she saw Neely and Mel steal away, she felt a stab of envy. Liam would be just arriving in New York now. She wondered if he was angry or did he feel miserable, too. They returned to Helen's suite at three in the morning, and Helen opened and split a champagne. She poured herself a large glass. Okay, now tell me what happened to Gina. Anne searched for the right words. It's my fault, I suppose, she said carefully. You see, I broke up with Alan. What? Why? Well, Leon and I were, well, we were together. So, Helen asked, I knew you were balling, Leon, in New Haven. What's that got to do with Alan? I couldn't see Alan anymore if I'm in love with Leon. Helen's eyes narrowed. Are you kidding? You don't think just because he's banging you, he's going to marry you, do you? Of course he will. <laughs> yes, he mentioned marriage. Helen, this just all happened three days ago. So where is your big Romeo now? I noticed he didn't stick with you. Anne didn't answer. Helen rushed on, driving her point home. Listen, a guy who is in love with you sticks with you. Alan's stuck, and he probably feels awful. That's why Gino didn't come, I bet. He probably thinks I'm cheap as you, Helen. Hey, how are you? Uh, Helen. Uh, you're, you think you're classy acting this way? You wear a guy's ring and leap in the feathers with the limey? 
and fuck me up with Gina? Sure, you think we're the same kind. He's afraid to see me now. I'm, he's afraid that I'll hurt him like you hurt his son. Hi, useful things channel. Good to see you. Uh, what did what I did with Alan has nothing to do with you and Gina. Hey, why isn't he here? He dug me pretty good. I can tell. He had laughs together. If it wasn't for you throwing yourself at Liam Burke, he'd be here with me now. I've lost a guy I love because you're a little tramp. Anne dashed across the room and grabbed her coat. Where do you think you're going? Helen asked. Refilling her glass, any place just to get away from you. <laughs> Helen sneered. Honey, you got no place to go but down. Do you think anyone cares about you? You and your prissy blue nose. At least I come out and call a spade a spade. But you played it the, you played it the great lady. Sure, as long as you wore that diamond, you were someone. I put up with you. I figured you must have something if Alan Cooper wanted you. It was your only claim to fame. You're nothing now, just another broad who'd been bawled by Leon Burke. Anne stared at her, and I thought you were my friend. Friend, what in hell have you got that I should be your friend? Who in hell are you, a stinking secretary and a big bore? And I lose a guy who digs me because of you, yet. Helen stood up, her legs wobbling. I'm going to bed. Sleep on the couch if you like. Anne's rage made her calm. Helen... You've just lost the only friend you ever had, Helen's face twisted. Things would be pretty rough if I had to rely on you for laughs and kicks. Anne went to the door. Goodbye, Helen, and good luck. No, sister, you're the one who needs the luck. All you got left is maybe a few more bangs from Leon Burke before he gets bored of you. And he gets bored easily. I know. I had my innings with him six years ago. She smiled at Anne's incredulous stare. That's right, me and, Le me and Leon. I was doing a no sh new show, and he had just joined Henry Bellamy. He was playing it smart, gave me a big romance treatment. He liked being seen with me, but at least I wasn't a jerk like you. I took it for what it was worth, enjoyed him and the kip, and when it per per petered out, that was it. And believe me, I had more to offer him than you, a two-bit secretary. Anne opened the door and rushed out, sick with disgust and anger. She reached the elevator and suddenly stopped. Her panic grew as she frantically searched through her bag. She had no money. She had rushed to meet Leon so quickly that she hadn't bothered to cash a check. She made a final search and found eight eighty-five cents. It was after four. She couldn't call Neely, but she couldn't walk to New York either. She sat on a chair near the elevator in the hall. If she went to the lobby and sat till nine, maybe then she could call Neely. Oh, God, she had ruined everything. She felt an overwhelming sense of loss. Helen was no longer her friend, but then it seemed Helen had never been her friend. Everyone had warned her. She had been warned about Leon, too. Leon and Helen, no, it couldn't be. But Helen wouldn't make up an outrageous lie like that. Oh, God, why, had Helen told, why hadn't Helen told her? She began to sob, muffling the sounds in her hands. She heard the elevator stop. She dabbed her eyes with her handkerchief and kept her head down. A girl... A girl got off and walked past and stopped and turned around. It's Anne, isn't it? Anne dabbed frantically at her eyes again. It was Jennifer North. What's wrong? Jennifer asked. Anne looked at the radiant girl. Just about everything, I'm afraid. Jennifer smiled compassionately. I've had days like that. Come on, my room is right down here. Maybe we can talk about it. She took Anne's hand and led her firmly down the hall. Sitting on the bed, chain smoking, Anne found herself telling Jennifer the entire story. At the end, Jennifer grinned. Wow, have you had a weekend? I'm sorry I put you through all this, Anne said, at such an hour. That's all right. I never slept any I never sleep anyway, Jennifer smiled. That's my big problem. But one of your problems is solved anyway. You stay here tonight. No, I really want to get back to New York. If you would lend me the money, I'll mail you a check tomorrow. Jennifer reached into her bag and tossed over her wallet. Help yourself, but I think you're mad. I've got two beds. You can get a good night's sleep and go back tomorrow on a decent train. I want to get back now. Anne took a $10 bill from her thick wallet. I'll mail you a check. Jennifer shook her head. No, wait till I get back to New York. Then you can take me to lunch. I want to hear the end of this. This is the end. Jennifer smiled, sure, with Helen and possibly Alan, but not with Leon, not the way you look when you mention his name. But how can I go back to him now after what Helen said? Jennifer looked incredulous. 
You mean that bothers you? You didn't think he was a virgin, did you? No, but Helen, he seems to think so little of her as a woman. Maybe he thought more of her six years ago. He was probably impressed with her, you know, working for Henry Bellamy, trying to be a success. I don't blame him if he did it with Helen. He probably had to, but I blame her for being such a rat as to throw it at you when she knows you care. But she says he hit, hits and runs, and I'm sure every man hits and runs with Helen. And she, slay, she solves her pride by being, believing that the man acts that way with everyone. She'll even con herself in believing that Gina would order. And I'm sure Leon is really stuck on you. Maybe not in love, but really stuck. But I've ruined everything now. He walked out on me. He probably feels she walked out on him in the way you did, choosing Helen over him. I didn't choose. I felt sorry for her. She was my friend. Some friend, Jennifer made a face. Look. Tomorrow when you see Leon, be really nice. Let your eyes fill with tears. Tell him you just learned how stupid you were to feel anything resembling friendship for Helen. Play it sweet, sweet and wounded. And for heaven's sake, don't dare mention what Helen told you about him. She followed Anne to the door. Remember, only one way to own a man, by making him want you, not with words. Now sleep on it. In fact, I should chain you up here for a few days so you don't mess things up. No, I want to go back, Anne. Jennifer followed her to the door. I like you. We'll be good friends. I want a real friend, too. Trust me. Do it my way if you want, Leon. Anne smiled weakly. I'll try, Jennifer. I'll try. The ride, ba ride back to New York seemed endless. The sun was shining. When she finally reached Penn Station, it was morning. People were pouring out of the Long Island section. She just had time to bathe. Good morning, Global Tutor Academy. Good to see you. She had just in time to bathe, have breakfast, and get to the office. Her eyes felt gritty in the cab, and her legs were like lead as she climbed the stairs to her room. She saw the telegram sticking out under the door. Leon, it had to be. She tore it open. Aunt, my passed away. Aunt Amy passed away in her sleep last night. Funeral would take place Wednesday. It would be nice if you could attend. Love, mother. She stared at the telegram, how like her mother. Not, please come, or I need you, but it would be nice. Well, she wouldn't go. Her mother didn't really care, didn't really want her there. It would just look nice for Lawrenceville. But she belonged here. She belonged to Leon. She reached for the phone and impulsively dialed him. After four rings, he answered. His voice sounded sleepy. She felt a twinge of anger. She had sat up all night on a cold train while he had been sleeping. Hello, he was awake now and irritated. She realized she, he, she was holding the receiver and not speaking. Hello, is someone on? Leon's voice clipped through the wire. She was frightened. He sounded angry. Is it Elizabeth? Elizabeth? She stared into the phone stupidly. Come now, this is a juvenile thing to do, Leon said coldly. Elizabeth, if you want to talk, say something or I'll hang up. He waited a moment, then put the receiver down with a click. Elizabeth? Who was Elizabeth? She felt sick at the sudden realization that Leon had a complete life she knew nothing about. She had really known him four days. God, it was just four days. Of course there was Elizabeth. Probably many Elizabeths. Hi, Robert Duran song covers. Good to see you. <clears throat> she called Western Union and wired, wired her mother that she would come immediately. Then she checked the trains. The next train to Boston left, left at 9.30. She threw some things into a bag. It was 8.30. She would have time to get to the bank and cash a check, but the office wasn't open yet. She had to let Henry know she wouldn't be in. <clears throat> she dialed Western Union again. Dear Henry, personal circumstances, call me away. We'll return and explain on Friday, Anne. She left for Boston, never realizing her formal wire would be misinterpreted. <clears throat> Henry had crushed the wire angrily. God damn it. She probably eloped with Alan Cooper. He kept his suspicions to himself and found himself being unusually short with Miss Stainberg and the rest of the office staff. On Friday, when he walked in and found her at her desk, he stared in delight, delighted astonishment. You're back, he shouted. I said I'd be back on Friday. I was positive you were married, he said. Married, she stared in amazement. George Bellows had come in. He seemed surprised to see her too. Married, she repeated. To whom? 
I just thought Henry looked foolish. I was afraid you would elope with Alan. Eloped? My aunt died. I had to go to Boston. The office wasn't open, so I sent you a wire. Who said I eloped? Henry threw his arms around her. Never mind, never mind your back, and I'm so glad. It was at that moment that Leon entered. He stopped abruptly when he saw her. Henry released her and turned his turn in boyish relief. She's back, Leon. Yes, I see, Leon's voice was emotionless. Anne dropped her eyes. I'm sorry if you all got the wrong impression. Her aunt died, Henry said jubilantly. Then forcing a sober expression, he added, I'm sorry, Anne, he turned to Leon. She only went to Boston for the funeral. Leon smiled and went to his office. Come on in, Henry said insistently. Here, want some coffee, a Danish, a raise, anything. I'm so happy, just th just name it. The buzzer on his desk sounded. He flipped a switch and Anne heard Leon's clipped voice. Henry, could you please send Anne in with the management contract for Neely O'Hara? Henry winked and clicked off the intercom. He opened his office cabinet and shuffled through some papers. We're handling your little friend. She hasn't any agent. She has only a small kind of future, strictly on the stage, but we're taking her on because of you. He handed Anne the papers and motioned her toward Leon's door. Leon stood up when she entered. I suppose Henry told you we're taking Neely on. She insists, says it will make her feel like a star. Anne kept her eyes on the contract. Yes, Henry told me. He came over to her and took the papers. He has also told you I've been lost, a lost soul for the past four days. She looked at him and he took her in his arms. Oh, Leon, Leon, she clung to him. I'm sorry about your aunt. None of us knew why you had gone. Henry acted as if you were actually never coming back. I couldn't believe that. I refused to believe you had gone out of my life. I know I acted badly, Anne. I should have waited that night. Helen is your friend and no. I was wrong. Hi there, good to see you. I was wrong. I'll never put anything before you. Again, Helen wasn't worth it. No, no one is worth it, oh, Leon. I love you so much. Good to see you, Global Tutor. I love you so much. I love you, Anne. You do, oh, Leon, do you really? She clung to him even harder. He kissed the top of her head. Really, really, he said lightly. But when she looked at him, she knew he meant it. At once again, she told herself she could never be as happy as she was this moment. She spent the weekend at Leon's apartment. She responded eagerly to his lovemaking. Hi. <laughs> Good to see you. Good to see you, baby world. Good to see you. Uh, she responded... Um, she spent the weekend at Leon's apartment. She responded eagerly to his lovemaking on the second night. Uh, no. She fell back, shaking and weak. He held her gently and stroked her hair. Oh, Leon, it happened. She shivered a little. For the first time, he said, I was beginning to worry about myself. Not at all. It's very rare for a girl to actually feel anything or reach climax in the beginning. She kissed his face eagerly. I function, Leon. I'm a woman. That night, she was aggressive in her lovemaking. She had never dreamed her physical passion could match her emotions, and she was glad and frightened at the same time. She not only loved Leon because he was Leon, she hungered for him physically. Her love seemed insatiable. There was only one nagging thought that crept through her perfect weekend. On Monday, she was to go to court and testify to Jennifer's annulment. I know you have to hate to do this, Anne, Henry said, but you're the only one I can trust. Jennifer's a stranger in New York. She doesn't know any girls. I'll be over and done with before you know it. Good to see you. I know. And don't worry about it. Just be in the office at 9.30. We're doing court at 10.30. Jennifer is coming in from Philadelphia for the day. We'll rehearse the whole deal before we leave for the office. She mentioned it several times during the weekend. And there were times she even thought about it when she was in Leon's arms. Look, if it really bothers you, you don't have to do it, Leon said. I know it's silly, Leon, but I'm scared. It is perjury, isn't it? Technically, yes, but it's done every day. I mean, no one really cares, not even the judge. But if this is against your principles, just tell Henry so, if necessary, he can get Miss Stainberg. Why didn't he ask her in the first place? He thought about it. Naturally, she was our first thought, but how far could we go even with a sym sympathetic judge with Jennifer North? 
like the kind of girl who made Miss Steinberg her chum and confidant. He reached for the phone. But don't fret about it. I'll ring Henry now. You don't owe Henry or Jennifer North a bloody thing, so why should you? Oh, Lord, she sat up in bed. Leon, don't call Henry. Why not? I owe Jennifer a great deal. Ten dollars, among other things. A complete, I completely forgot. She loaned me money for the train fare from Philadelphia. She told him the Helen Lawson incident, carefully omitting Helen's reference to him. But she'd forgotten to tell him how Jennifer had sympathized and, bought, and bailed her out. I mean to send her the money, but when I got back to New York, there was the wire and I just took off for Lawrenceville. Well, you can relax. I'm sure Jennifer isn't worried about $10. I'll give it back to her tomorrow. Still, she was awfully nice to me that night. I guess the least I could do is testify for her. Well, very well, if you think it will even, even the score. She looked at him. That's such a final expression, Leon, as if it finishes you off with a person like I paid a bill. I remember when you had used it with me, it was like closing a door in my face. With you, when? When I thanked you for Neely, for getting her the job, you said it, it even the score for getting you this apartment. Our apartment now, he said. She looked at him mistily. Our apartment? Why not, unless you're attached to that one room of yours on West 52nd Street. I think we have ample closet space here, and I'm quite neat to live with. She threw her arms around him. Oh, Leon, we haven't known each other long, but I think I knew. I, I knew the moment we met you were the only man I'd ever want to marry. He broke the embrace gently. I'm asking you to move in, and that is all I can ask for the present. She turned away from him. More embarrassed than hurt, Leon took her by the shoulders and turned her gently to face him. And I do love you. She tried to blink back the tears, but they choked through her words. When people love one another, they get married. In Lawrenceville, perhaps, where things are settled at birth and futures are in place. Your future is very much in place. Henry believes in you. I'm not sure I want to stay with Henry. I suddenly don't seem to be sure of anything. But I am sure I don't want Henry's kind of life. He looked thoughtful. You see, I had decided after war that I was coming back to Henry and the old way of life, but I did come back, and Henry's enthusiasm got to me. I almost slipped into the old pattern and then had lunch in the bar Barbary room. You gave me a quite, quite a jolt that day. Started me thinking. Then the weekend in New Haven and Terry King business, he shook his head. Then the smashing blow when you disappeared, I started to evaluate things carefully, and I made a decision. I'm going to have a go at writing that book. That's wonderful, Leon, but how would marriage change things? Let's say I still have a few old-fashioned ideas. I do think a husband should support his wife. If I married you, I'd throw myself into the action at Henry's 100%. I'd make a lot of money, but, he'd have a bad, but we'd have a bad marriage. Are you going to leave Henry? Unfortunately, I can't. I have enough money saved to take a few months off, but it's too big of a risk. I'll stay with Henry and write the book on the side. A few snatched hours at night, a weekend. It's not the ideal way, but unfortunately at the moment, it's the only way. There's no country home to retreat to, and I'm aware of the hazards ahead. Even if it's accepted, the advance for an unknown writer is small. It takes six or eight months to come out. And sometimes, even with a good book, the author makes very little money. The runaway bestsellers are the rare exception, so I have two alternatives. Remain with Henry and work in my free time or find a rich old woman to subsidize me. I'm not old or rich, but I have some money, and I could go on working. He ran his hands through his hair, watching the heavy silk fall between his fingers. With your marvelous stipend from Henry and my savings, we still couldn't swing this apartment. But I told you I have money. I have $5,000 that my father left me, and I just inherited 7000 from my aunt. That's 12000 Leon. It's more than enough. He whistled, good Lord, I found me an heiress. He kissed her warmly, and I'm truly touched, but it couldn't work. Right now, I'm not sure I can write. I'm not sure the book would even be good. At this very moment, there must be half a million XGIs sitting at typewriters and hamming, hammering out their personal versions in Normandy, Okinawa, at, or the London Blitz. In each of us, we really have something to say. It's just a matter of who says it first and who says it best. I'm sure you can write, she insisted. I just know it. Then you know more than I, which is delightful, be uh, devoted, and I love you for it. 
Leon, after the book is finished, will you marry me? I shall be delighted to if the book turns out to be a good one. She was silent for a moment, but you said yourself, even a good book doesn't always make money. I didn't say money was the barometer. If the book was good, and if it didn't make a dime, I'd continue to write. I'd work even harder because then I knew it was more than a dream, and we'd make out somehow. But if it turns out to be unacceptable to any publisher, then I would go at my job with Henry on the double. I'd haul out the old Leon Burke and make up for the wasted years, and I'm not sure that you could care very much for me. What was the old Leon Burke like? He thought for a moment. No wasted moments. Yes, I guess that would be appropriate. I never made a move without a premeditated reason. Not even this. His hand stroked her breast. The memory of Helen's shrill voice filled her ears. Then it was true. The old Leon would have had an affair with Helen. He had practically admitted it. He took her in his arms. But that Leon Burke was killed in action, or perhaps he died the night the boy talked about the peach trees. It's so perhaps he didn't spend that night last night in vain. She put her arms around him. You could never go back. Not when you talked like this. If this book doesn't make it, then you're, you're work on another and another. You are what you are now, and nothing will ever change that again. If you want to stay with Henry and write, I'll wait. I'll wait forever. If it takes a dozen books, just stay be, just stay being you. I don't know whether me is that great to be, but it is better than being Henry Bellamy. And that's where I was heading, in fact. I'd have been even bigger than Henry because I wasn't as nice. Henry vacillate, vacillates, takes time out to care. I have one have a one-track mind. I've been a king-size Henry, a large success and a personal failure. Is that what you think of Henry? Henry struggled for 30 years to get where he is, the top. I guess you'd call it. It's a trite word. He calls it Mount Everest, but that's where he is, financially and professionally. But what about his personal life? If one were to write up Henry who's who, where uh, there would be several paragraphs devoted to his theatrical business achievements, to his personal life, one line, unmarried, no living relatives, and short, no life aside from the business, alone on the summit of Mount Everest. But you're only proving my point, Leon. Henry kept waiting to get married. You're doing the same thing. No, because a marriage is meaningless on Mount Everest. There are men like Henry who marry and have children and families, but their personal life is the same. After all, let's suppose Henry got married to a nice girl out of the business. The children would be married now, attending to their children. The wife would be spending the winter in Florida. She'd have given up nagging at Henry for his erratic hours, and by now she would be accustomed to living without his companionship, a thing she never had. She would have settled for the nice things that came out of Henry's dedication, a large apartment or townhouse, the furs, the style of living. There are many Henrys who are married and who wind up at the top alone. Hi. They have to be alone because they've alienated everyone along the way. In this rat race, you whore, lie, cheat, and every and use every trick you can to employ to get there where Henry is. This business demands it. And that's what I'm ranting against. Not Henry personally, but what everyone turns into if he sticks in it long enough. They were both quiet for a few moments. Leon spoke first. Sorry I sounded like this. No, I'm glad. I understand you better. I'm just worried about one thing. He looked at her warmly. What? When are you going to marry me? He laughed out loud. She wondered if he knew how wonderful he looked when he did that. She had never known anyone who laughed like that, who threw his head back and let go. His laugh had a wonderful ring to it. I'll tell you what. You shall be the first to read the completed manuscript, and then you can tell me. She snuggled against him. I'd better go to sleep, she whispered. I've got a lot to do tomorrow. Oh, yes, the annulment business. Mm. And Leon, have you an extra key to your apartment? He held her tight. I'll have one made. Then you are moving in. No, but I'm moving in a typewriter and plenty of blank paper first thing tomorrow. Bright, shiny new typewriter. It'll be my pre-writing gift to you. I'll accept it on one condition. You move in with it. No, I'll come and stay like this whenever you want me. I'll spend weekends with you and type up your pages, but I won't live with you. I'll live for you and wait. 
He kissed her brow. As a lawyer, I should tell you that you're getting the short end of the deal. But as your lover, I promise I shall try hard not to let you down. The court appearance was brief. Any fears Anne might have had were immediately dismissed as she watched and cut and dried, cut and dried procedure. Henry handed some papers to the judge. The judge made a pretense of reading them. A few questions were exchanged. Jennifer, Jennifer testified with her rehearsed speech. Anne chatted her lines. In less than 10 minutes, Jennifer had her annulment. Henry took both girls to lunch. He ate quickly. I have work waiting, he explained, but you two girls can sit and rehash all the events and take the rest of the afternoon off. The moment Henry left, Jennifer turned to Anne and asked, Now tell me, how did it work out with you and Leon? Jennifer listened while Anne told her everything that had happened. It surprised Anne how quickly and easily she confided in Jennifer. There was something about Jennifer that invited trust. Jennifer shook her head. He sounds rough. You'll never be able to control him, but I don't want to control Leon. I don't mean that mean that way. A man must feel he runs things, but as long as you control yourself, you control him. Get him to put a ring on your finger, then be the slave girl if you wish. <laughs> Anne looked at her ringless hand. That's not important. I have the biggest ring you ever saw lying in a safe deposit box. Jennifer stared at her with new respect. You mean you managed to get rid of Alan and keep the ring? He didn't want it back, Jennifer shook her head. You must really do something special in bed. I thought I had all the answers. I never went to bed with Alan. For a moment, Jennifer was speechless. Then she grinned. That's what was special. You were a challenge to Alan. Well, I'm afraid I'm no challenge to Leon. Still, I'll keep my finger crossed. Keep my fingers crossed. At least you did one thing right. You refused to move in with him. I'm doing the same thing with Tony Poehler. He wants me to quit the show and travel with him. No marriage talk either, but I'm no camp follower. By the way, how large are, is your apartment? One room. I live in a boarding house, some place, same place as Neely. I have no place to live when the show comes in, Jennifer said. It would be nice if we could find a place to share. Sounds wonderful, but I don't think I can really afford even half of an apartment. Say, Jennifer's eyes sparkled. I've got a great idea. You say Neely has a room? What if the three of us took a place together? Then we could afford it. I love it, Anne said. We came back to town in three weeks. Maybe you could swing something by then. I'll look at things. I'll, I'll look, but things are pretty tight. I found Leon's apartment right away, but Alan did that for me. Jennifer's blue eyes suddenly narrowed. Anne, what are you planning to do about the ring? Anne shrugged. Leave it in the vault, I guess. I certainly have no desire to wear it. Just leave it there when it could be working for you. Just leave it there when it could be working for you? How? Sell it. Invest the money. But it's not really mine. You offered it back and he refused. It's yours. And you earned it. Anytime you put up with a man's company, when you can't stand him, you should have something to show for it. Sell it. Anne thought of Liam. Perhaps Jennifer was right at the end of the year. If the book wasn't successful and she did have some real money, maybe you're right. I could sell the ring and put the money in the bank and let the interest pile up. You'll do nothing of the kind, Jennifer said. Sell the ring and ask Henry Bellamy to invest your money in the market. You can double your money in a few years. There's always a bull market after a war, but isn't that risky? Not now, and not if Henry manages it for you. Henry told me the market is going boom. I wish I had some money. I'd have... I haven't a, just what's on my back and what I make in the show. But the minute I get my hands on some big money, I'm letting Henry invest it. Oh, wow. That is just crazy. We are up to page 184. And this chapter is called Jennifer. So we're going to get to find all about Jennifer. Hi, good to see you. I don't speak Japanese or I don't speak your language, but I'm so happy to see everyone. We are reading ah, Valley of the Dolls by Jacqueline Suzanne. It is just so saucy. My goodness. So we are, we'll pick up, maybe I'll pick up some later if I get back early enough. So we'll see. Here is my shout out as my fan. It's just the right fan. I like this fan because I can dismantle it. I can take it all apart and clean the fan bay blades. I had another fan that I couldn't take apart, and the fan blades were so dusty. And then I looked at it, and there was all this hair all wrapped around it. And I, I said, that is not acceptable. 
I got rid of it. And I need another one. I had another one just like this that died. The motor blew out. But it's not the time of year to buy fans. It's winter. I have to wait another couple of months. And when I fans start showing up in the store, I'll buy a couple because uh, these this is just the right fan. Until then, I have to wait. And this is my product placement is my barrettes. Look at the whole, I'll, this is like a lifetime supply of barrettes. And this, it opens and then it snaps shut. It's very clever design. It's low tech, but highly useful. Whoops. And then I just clip my hair back like that. Or sometimes I'll just do one side. I'll pull it back when, the, when it's humid. I usually pull it back because the humidity makes my hair frizzy. That's that. And we are going to get on with the day. And if I have time, I'll read some more later. Let me know you were here so I can set you to moderator. And I'll go back and I'll watch your videos. I'm so happy to see you. I hope you have a wonderful day. Big kiss.